On June 21st, 2018, the boys of the Wild Boys Football Club set out for training as usual. They were a football team of 11 to 16 year old boys with a coach and an assistant coach. Training went on as usual and the head coach said goodbye to his players and got ready for the older team's upcoming game, putting his phone to the side. A few hours later, when the coach pulls out his cell phone again, he sees countless missed calls from the boy's parents. The children hadn't shown up at home, despite hours having passed. The coach calls his players individually, but none of the children nor the team's assistant coach could be reached. Until one player finally answers the phone. Song Paul, a 13-year-old team member. He's receiving the call from home as he was picked up from training by his mother. But he tells the coach that the other team members rode their bicycles to the nearby Tamluang Caves in order to explore them together with their assistant coach. The coach heads straight to the caves. But when he gets there, he makes a terrifying discovery. At the cave entrance, the coach finds the kids' abandoned bicycles, which means that the team is still inside the cave. Only now, a rapid stream of water flows through the cave entrance, creating a life-threatening situation. The heavy rain had started just when the boys were inside, and if they are still alive, they are now trapped. Thai police officers find backpacks and other items left behind by the boys. However, apart from the cave entrance, it was not possible to search deeper inside, as the water level was so high that it blocked further access. In addition to local authorities, special divers from the Thai Navy SEALs are called to the Chiang Rai region, where a crisis management team is set up to coordinate a rescue of the team. Also, a British civilian approaches Thai authorities, offering his help. The man's name is Vern Onsworth, an experienced caver who lives in the area and has a good understanding of the Tamluang cave system having been the one who has been exploring and mapping this cave for years. Tam Luang is said to be the fourth longest cave in Thailand, and just over a kilometer past the entrance, this cave splits into two paths at a T-section. From here, the entire cave extends over 10 kilometers deep, and the kids, if they were still alive, would most likely be further inside on a higher elevated section. The fact that Unsworth was there was a stroke of luck. He connected Thai authorities with the British Cave Rescue Council and enabled cave divers John Volanton and Rick Stanton to fly in and join the search efforts. John and Rick were longtime dive buddies with a great deal of trust between them, as they have performed a large number of rescue and body recovery missions together. Out of the breaking news overseas, 12 players and their coach missing. We don't know how far they have gone. With new experts arriving every day, there are growing fears that it might already be too late before specialized cave divers can really get started. If the boys were still alive, they would probably have run out of food. After all, they had only planned to spend about an hour in the cave. Meanwhile, heavy rainfall leads to rising water levels inside the cave, and instead of progress, the Thai Navy SEALs were now even less able to advance inside. And when the British cave divers showed up, there was a certain skepticism as to what these older men could contribute that Navy SEALs couldn't. As far as I know, there's no like, theater of war inside a cave, so they've never ever been in a cave in their lives. So, of course, they haven't got those sort of spatial skills to navigating one, which we've honed all, over all those years. 
For John, cave diving is a passion, and yet also a hobby. Full-time, he works as an IT consultant, and Rick Stanton is a former firefighter. But while the two civilians lack athletic or military understanding, they have a special skill set that is perfectly suited for the conditions here. Although they are only civilians, they are the absolute experts when it comes to cave diving. And getting through the cave here requires many different skills, because while large parts are flooded, there are also passages where you can walk through the cave. And at other places, some climbing is necessary. Tam Luang had very poor visibility, so in lots of places you literally couldn't see your hand in front of your face and you had to almost feel your way along. Sometimes I just headed into the current because I simply couldn't see where I was going, I couldn't see any walls and so on. Rick and John are working their way through the deep cave system step by step, placing guidelines along the way. This first dive through the cave is particularly challenging because they have to swim against the water current. There was a really strong current. You, you probably couldn't swim against it for a long distance, so we were on the floor with our hands in the sand, pulling ourselves along. That was the only way to make progress. Once Rick and John placed guidelines in a section, other divers could partially pull themselves along and orientation was made a lot easier, though still a challenge. The diver's target is a section called Pattaya Beach, which is a large chamber that is located at higher elevation and could offer protection from the floodwaters. Perhaps this is where the boys went. But before advancing this far, John and Rick have to interrupt their search. The rain kept getting heavier, and as they fought, this might ultimately determine the fate of the boys. Considering the conditions, Rick and John have to pause their dives. Nonetheless, no thought was given to surrender amidst the Thai Navy SEALs, who were working around the clock to do anything that would help reduce the water levels. In addition, countless volunteers are joining the surge, such as Saman Kunan, a former Navy SEAL himself, and an experienced diver who joined to help. The SEALs set up a permanent camp inside the cave at Chamber 3. This larger cavern provided enough unflooded space to permanently station equipment, air tanks and divers. Even amidst a bleak situation, they tried everything they could to divert rivers, find new cave entrances and use pumping stations to force as much water out of the cave as possible. No sign of life from 12 boys and their soccer coach. The boys have now been missing for 72 hours. Locals are holding out uh, hope that they're still alive. Driven by the enthusiasm of the local search teams and considering the slightly improved weather situation, the British volunteers began to join the help again, embarking on their longest dive into the cave system so far, with the goal of finally reaching Pattaya Beach. After a long and exhausting dive, they finally make it and are now at the highest point of the cave system. But still, there is no sign of the boys. From here on, there is no way of continuing to dive responsibly. The basic rule is to use about a third of the air for the way in, so that you have another third left for the way back, and one third as your reserve. The divers were already way past that rule. But they decided to not give up just yet, and advance further into the cave system, laying guide wire throughout. They continue making their way more than twice as far from the T-section as their initial destination, Pattaya Beach, when they eventually swim up to the water's surface and suddenly notice a light. As John swims towards the light and starts hearing voices, he turns on his camera. Yeah, what's your hand? Thank you. Thank you. How, how many of you? 13. Brilliant. 
Yes, it's okay. Many people are coming. Many, many people. We are the first. Many people come. What, what day? Tomorrow. What day? No, no, no. What day is it? No, I'll see. <laughs> Monday. Monday. Okay, but one week and Monday. You have been here ten days. Ten days. You are very strong. Just describe the media interest in this story. It's huge here. Yeah. It's huge here. 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 To find the boys there is a huge relief for the authorities and just for the nation in general, actually. The following day, three Thai Navy SEALs dived to the team to stay with them for the remaining time. As enthusiastic as the world reacted to the boys being found, those involved in the rescue knew that finding the boys is the easy part. But no one had any idea how to get them out of the cave. So the plan for now is this. They are trying to furiously pump as much water out of this cave as possible. Elon Musk built a kid-sized submarine after the rescue team rejected his offer, claiming that a rigid craft couldn't negotiate the sinuous cave tunnels the Tesla boss lashed out on Twitter. In previous cave rescues, drilling has been used as a way to get people out. And the final option is to leave the group inside the cave until around mid-October, when the monsoon season finally ends. On one hand, there was the option to teach the boys how to dive. They could practice short dives with instructors in their cave until they are ready to take on the long, difficult journey out. Option two was to rescue the team using an emergency elevator in a newly drilled shaft, somewhat similar to the 2010 rescue of miners in Chile. Finally, there was also the option to simply wait until the rainy season is over. As long as they are trapped, the team would be provided with food and would be able to walk out of the cave once the water level went down. While to outsiders it appeared as though there are many difficult options to choose from, the rescuers on site came to the realization that it was even worse, that none of these options was realistic. Teaching the kids to dive in this extreme environment is not possible. Not only are some of the boys unable to swim, they are also exhausted and tired from days of no proper sleep. In addition, the path through the narrow, dark cave has nothing to do with recreational scuba diving, and a panic attack would mean certain death. Drilling a shaft was also completely unrealistic. In the case of the miners in Chile, it took about seven weeks after their discovery before they could be freed. The situation in the Thai cave was not much better. The team was almost a kilometer underground, and in between there was mostly solid rock that is difficult to drill through. And even if this approach was used, it's unclear how to exactly determine the location of the boys, so that the borehole perfectly lines up with their chamber. Lastly, waiting until the end of rainy season is also doomed to fail. The oxygen level in the chamber is already in a dangerous range that is not survivable for a sustained time. And it was still only the beginning of the rainy season, which lasts until November. The team might have had to hold out for more than four months, during which increasing rain could endanger the safe spot they were in. The rescuers were out of options. On top of that, word of a tragic new development made rounds. Waking up to this news this morning, the man who died was young, he was fit, he was a former Navy SEAL, and I think it really just underlines how dangerous this cave is. Saman Kunan, the retired Navy SEAL who volunteered to help, had died. A painful loss and a reminder of just how dangerous this entire operation is. 
Saman Kunan, died from lack of oxygen, his dive partner finding him unconscious in the water. With no realistic rescue plan available, a somewhat insane idea is thrown into the room. What if the children were sedated and then transported through the cave system while being unconscious? At this point, Rick Stanton gets in touch with an old acquaintance, Dr. Richard Harris. Harris is an anesthesiologist from Australia and a cave diver with over 30 years of experience. Harris is averse to the plan and considers sedating the boys far too dangerous, with low chances of survival. Still, he travels to Thailand. And what ultimately convinces him is not a change of his risk assessment, but the realization that there is simply no better option. To do this, a team was assembled and flown in, made up of some of the best cave divers in the world. The kids in the cave would put on a wetsuit and then be given two shots of sedative drugs, leaving them fully unconscious. Then, a special diving mask is put on that covers the entire face and supplies positive pressure so that even if a gap opens underwater, the air pressure should keep the water out. The boys' hands were tied behind their back to keep their arms from swinging around. And a tank filled with 80% oxygen was placed in front of the boys' chests so that their head cannot fully tilt down, which could result in a blocked airway. The kids would also be tethered to their diver so that they could not get lost. And from this point on, the lives of these kids were literally in these divers' hands. If anything had happened to the mask that was keeping their face dry, if it had been knocked in any way, then the, the child would unquestionably have drowned. For longer intermediate segments in which the cave can be crossed on foot, the boys were taken onto a stretcher and transported towards the next diving segment. The drugs given to the kids are not enough for the whole journey, and the diver has to administer a new drug to the child with a pre-made syringe. Throughout the entire way, the divers fear for the kids' lives. But when the first two kids make it safely to chamber three, confidence grows. It appears as though this insane plan is actually working. From here on out, the water had at this point successfully been drained, and the Navy SEALs, together with countless volunteers, transported the boys in stretchers through the remaining rocky terrain. Reports from Northern Thailand say at least four boys have been brought out. We've got live pictures here. You can see the helicopter blades. And ambulances. Yes, ambulances, we saw those. On the first day, four boys were successfully rescued. And the following day, another four kids were saved. On the third and last day, the plan was to rescue the last four boys and the assistant coach. But as well established as the procedure seemed at this time, something suddenly didn't work. The last boy was the smallest of them all, and the positive pressure mask didn't fit his small face. No matter how tight the divers pressed the mask against the face, it didn't form a watertight seal. The divers were forced to try another mask, which they had taken with them but had hoped that they would never need it. It is a small children's mask, more suited for recreational use. And even this one barely fits the face and keeps slipping off. But the divers secure it as good as possible, and then hope for the best. Extraordinary moment here as we are now learning that entire team is now free of that cave. The rescue operation was tense until the very last second. But now it was done. 
all the children and the assistant coach were saved. A success greater than even the divers had expected. Although not without a prize. A Thai Navy SEAL contracted a blood infection during the rescue operation. Bairud Pakbara was a petty officer first class who had struggled with health problems ever since the operation. One year after the rescue, he passed away. With that, two Thai Navy SEALs gave their lives to save the football team. They represent the relentless effort that these Thai Navy SEALs put into the mission. And despite some skepticism on both sides at the beginning, the British divers and the Thai Navy SEALs ultimately complemented each other ideally and were able to proceed strategically and efficiently. A success story that was watched around the world. Your heroes now. Did you feel that? If you could do something for somebody else's child, I'm sure you would too. We just had a, a peculiar set of skills that were appropriate in that moment. Please welcome the Wild Horse soccer team. This was a story that I've been meaning to tell for a while, and I'm glad that I finally got to put it on YouTube. But there are a couple of things that aren't ideal. For videos to be able to make ad money on YouTube, they have to be advertiser friendly, which was fine with this topic, but is just not the case with certain subject matters. One of my favorite videos I've made is a detailed look at the 2011 raid on the compound where Osama Bin Laden was hiding full of custom 3D animations. But this is a very brutal subject matter that would get demonetized and perhaps even age restricted on YouTube. Another thing on YouTube is that ad revenue sort of limits how much effort I can put into a single video. There's more that I can do creatively and I'm not alone. It turns out lots of creators feel that way. And so what we did is we all joined together to build a solution. It's called Nebula and it's our very own streaming service. Here I have an exclusive series called Underexposure in which I explore these topics that just couldn't work on YouTube. And since Nebula is a subscription model, I get to work with higher budgets turning my dream projects into reality. I am immensely proud of all of these projects as I fully had the chance to creatively tell stories in ways that just wouldn't be possible on YouTube. And over 650,000 people already enjoy Nebula right now. So join them and head to nebula.tv neo and make sure that you use that link so that you get 40% off on an annual plan. So choose which plan is right for you.